All right, now, everybody, quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind, but we're going to have a show. What up, friends? Turn that smile into a grin. Turn that grin into a laugh. We are on the air feeling great. Oh, yeah. Tony is on top of whatever technical issues we were working on before, and it's my second day with the um, new kind of in-ear headpiece thing, and it's, um, uh, it's an experience. Um, so far, not a good experience, but an experience nonetheless. So there is that. Uh, Kim is here. Hi, Kim. Kim how are you? Hi. You're Kim not so, is, the camera's uh, not so cough. close. She's to really you today. got that cough down to the point where she's getting super good at it after yeah. a couple of months. How long have you had the cough, Kim? God, has it been two weeks or so? Yeah, it seems weeks. like it. Jeez. Are you doing a um, nebulizer or a. No. Um, no? I'm no. just letting it, you know, drag out till it's over. Did you see that piece about the people who do the, um, what is that called? The thing that where they shoot water through their nasal a, passages every a morning? Neti pot. A neti, neti pot. pot, yeah. There was an article I'm, the other I'm day I was that. reading that suggests that, um, A, there are a bunch of neti pot recalls and oh. that the neti pot thing may not be so great for you. Uh, in fact, I'll get the piece now because I hate to just do that to people. I know a lot of people love the neti pot and yeah. swear by the neti pot. I mean, the neti pot people talk about neti pot the way the Jesus people talk about Jesus. Like, just like life-changing, you've got to do this, you've got to embrace this, you've got to every day, you've got to neti pot. I see that, Gordon. I hope you rot in jail, Mr. Navarro. We can probably take that uh, down. I think we've given Gordon a, and that sentiment mm -hmm. um, in the, there we go. I wonder if Mark's coffee machine broke. <laughs> My, <laughs> I actually do have a story about what's happening with the coffee machine, but I am rocking the Coachella right now. John mm. says, I got a neti pot about six weeks ago, and I still haven't worked up the courage to use it yet. It, it is a freaky fact that it seems so unnatural, this neti pot thing, that you really... Uh, it, you have to steal your courage to actually do it. So... Look, I'm not saying this. your neti pot's not going to be a great experience, but I will give you <laughs> it seems what like I read. I'm just going to tell you what, look, I do a lot of reading, and I read a lot of stuff across my desk that doesn't necessarily apply to me, but I think, oh, that's interesting, and it just, for some reason, it landed. So when the subject of neti pot came up just a second ago, I thought, oh, I read this piece uh, not too long ago, and here is the headline, Okay. Neti pots linked to eye, brain, and spinal cord infections caused by amoeba in water. What? Okay, that's, yeah. that's, that's got to be really rare, though. Uh, the CDC recommends people use distilled water instead of tap water because tap water is not sterile. Mm -hmm. For your nasal irrigation practices, they recommend distilled water. The CDC says that uh, CDC says that neti pots may be a transmission route for the invasive microorganism and uh, acanthamoeba. The amoeba can cause eye and skin infections as well as a serious brain and spinal cord infection. The CDC says tap water isn't sterile and should not be used for nasal irrigation. Maybe it is the use of tap water that's producing all of this stuff. Mm. But uh, anyway, just. Look, most people use neti. I'm telling you, people I talk to who use neti pots every day, they love them. They love them. They think that they, I mean, are transformational is what I yeah. hear. So, does it seem like self waterboarding? <laughs> I mean, Wes said he has one that's battery powered, like that forced water shooting up your nose. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, they flush the nasal passages and alleviate allergy symptoms and a bunch of other, you know, sinus infection related stuff i mean it can make life a lot better i guess do not use pond water says kathleen <laughs> what <laughs> um look i don't want to scare you but at the same time i don't want to minimize it i mean people have died from this that's why but that, again as kim says 
the universe of people using neti pots is a pretty expansive one, and the number of people who have died from it is you can count on one hand. Yeah. So I, I really don't. Uh, but anyway, that's the neti pot thing. So, Kim, you're not using a neti pot, and you still have the cough. That's how we got into this. Oh, maybe I should invest in it. Maybe I should waterboard myself. I'm not saying that's the thing that would change things but i am saying that there is a you know uh, yeah. which maybe you do not know what you are talking about it's true that i do not know what i'm talking about so i cannot uh now i wanted to uh, quickly update mark's madness we are in the middle of a mark's madness first round that has produced some upsets in my world anyway uh, for example this one was a tough one to call yesterday one of these drops had to go on. It was word from the Lord or Larry King scene. Again, it, in other words, people voted yesterday. The voting is over for the, this is a word from the Lord and he's not happy. Or what can you tell us about the scene? Scene one. So those of you who are into the Larry King scene and had that in your bracket, Larry King scene one. The second hour was Pure speculation. That's pure speculation. Yeah, and uh, it went up against Oprah's what? What? It's very tough to beat Oprah's what? That's pure speculation. Uh, and Oprah's what? what? So uh, yesterday again, Oprah's what won. So the Oprah's what people are happy this morning. You go on to the next round. So uh, now, uh, today, we will have two more this hour, and we will have two more next hour. It is my favorite time of year. It's Mark's Madness! No. Mark's Madness! Damn straight, right now, you will vote for one of these two. Either... Why are you yelling? Why are you yelling, or... The image is hideous. Hideous. Simon's the image is hideous. Either... Why are you yelling? Why are you yelling, or... The image is hideous. Hideous. Why are you yelling or hideous? You can vote for the entire hour live in the chat. Also, after the show, most people watch the show afterward, or if you're listening, you can vote in our community section on YouTube. You go to YouTube, and there on our channel, it'll say live, video, shorts, community. That's where you can vote for, in this case, why are you yelling or Simon hideous? And... Good luck and Godspeed. The Mark Thompson Show. No fun in Ruth Bader Ginsburg land. Mm -mm. I'll get to that in a moment, but I first want to mention David K. Johnston joins us in the second hour. We will talk about the addition, potentially, of Paul Manafort to the world of Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump's world now is marked immensely by the need for money. I mean, money that he needs now. And I want to talk to David K. Johnson about Manafort in that context. I mean, just in a general context, because he is, Manafort, as you're well aware, is essentially a tributary from the Russian and the kind of old Eastern Bloc um, oligarchy. So he consulted on elections there. He's very mobbed up there. I mean, almost literally mobbed up there. And so the addition of Paul Manafort to the Trump world, and again, remember, he worked on Trump's campaign already in 2016. And I'll remind you, he went to prison. He was found guilty, I believe, on eight different charges, all kinds of financial crimes, from money laundering to tax, et cetera. I mean, this guy really is used to working the dark side of the street. And he was pardoned by then-President Trump. And so Manafort escaped that long prison sentence. He likely would have remained in prison for the rest of his adult life. But in any case, he's free, and now Trump wants to get the band back together. So what I'm suggesting is, and what I want to ask Debbie K. Johnston about, is I think that... He was then in 2016, and he is now in 2024, a connection, Paul Manafort is, to Russian money. And with all other traditional mainstream options closed off to Trump to get money, it's very possible that Manafort opens the door or helps facilitate a negotiation between Trump world and Russian money. 
that could help him out enormously. So uh, that's one of the things we'll talk to David K. Johnston about. I um, and of course there used to be yeah. a time when if you had a controversial pardon of someone that you know you you kind of distance yourself from them. You don't then embrace them and put them back into the position. What what kind of what kind of crazy world is this? Yeah, well, remember, this is a guy who doubles down on everything. Donald God. Trump doubles down on everything, right? He never apologizes. He doubles down. Even the bloodbath thing, which we'll talk to David K. Johnson mm -hmm. about, which, to be honest, I and I'm going to say this, I've already taken a lot of blowback in the chat for this, and in the after hours trading, I got <laughs> uh, blasted in comments for saying this, but I was just saying that he was making the bloodbath comments uh, in the context. It's really weird what people get angry at. I was saying... Yeah that he makes the bloodbath comments Trump did. And this is to your point. I mean, he he mm -hmm. uh, didn't back away from them. He made the bloodbath comments in the context of bringing Chinese automobiles in untaxed, untariffed into this country. It was part of his rambling crap about how he's going to put 100% tariff on Chinese automobiles coming into this country, et cetera. And if that doesn't happen, and if I'm not elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for that industry, is what he was saying. And that'll be the least of your problems. It's going to be, uh, if he didn't say bloodbath, I've given Tony the video. We'll run it when we get to David K. Johnston again, just to remind everybody exactly what was said. I don't mean to obsess on that, although the world seems to be obsessing on it. That's why I'm revisiting it. The reason people got angry at me is because I said, actually, the thing that bothered me more than that, maybe I'm just getting used to that bloodbath crap. Right. Um, and I don't mean to minimize it, but I was just saying that he was calling the J6 people hostages and he was essentially underscoring the fact that he's going to take care of those people who were part of the J6 invasion of the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was and, and he opened his comments with the J6ers singing the national anthem. I mean, so to me, when you talk about abhorrence, and the things that you find most repulsive, that was a thing that landed with me. Maybe the bloodbath thing should have landed with me bigger. It didn't. I saw it in the context of him rambling in the uh, auto industry. I'm sure David is going to agree with all of you that uh, he was stoking the kind of um, mm. one-off terrorism that we and, and one-off violence that we are now beginning to fear and I think legitimately have anxiety about in in this new age of uh donald trump so i mean perhaps you, know. you have the context and that perhaps that's what he meant but you don't have a, a, a former president who is facing charges in connection with a capital riot you don't have a former president who's calling the january 6th criminals hostages you don't have someone who's people are fearing is going to do away with democracy and have them stand up and say, if I don't get elected come November, it's going to be a bloodbath. What do you think people are going to think when you say that? I mean, is there a, a brain in your head when you open the hole in your face to speak? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a... Um... Kim, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Very well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, keep that um, anger resentment going. You'll need it. Thank you. Um, let me get back to uh, RBG for a quick second. You know, the Mark Thompson show. So uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, had an award named for her. Okay. And the award was given to people who uh, are accomplished women. And they have been doing this since. 2019 that's when the award began and award recipients barbara streisand queen elizabeth ii but this year this opperman foundation selected four men including conservative media titan rupert murdoch billionaire elon musk and then finally the woman in the group is martha stewart Well, the RBG Foundation didn't really groove on that. Ginsburg's family blasted the selection. They said the decision is an affront, in their words, 
to the memory of the late justice and to her values. And so now there was, you can imagine, there at the Opperman Foundation, which is charged with this award and deciding who gets it, the Opperman Foundation had a huddle, right? What do you do? You have this award named for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You're working with the family, and they are publicly calling you out for this mistake and this affront, really, to the memory of their their mother. They're dealing with the, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's daughter. Jane is her name, Jane Ginsburg. Anyway, so they decided not to do it. They literally canceled it, you know. You really have a fork in the road there. You can go, well, we can retract the invite that we had issued to Rupert Murdoch and to Elon Musk, or we can just cancel things completely, and that's what they did. The five that were to have been recipients of the 2024 RBG Leadership Award were Martha Stewart, Elon Musk, Murdoch, I mentioned, Michael Milken. You'll remember Michael Milken was the guy who was running Drexel during the junk bond stuff of the, was that the 80s and 90s? It was crazy. Michael Milken went to prison, okay? But you can argue, well, he went to prison, he paid his debt to society, and he's reconstituted himself as a guy who now has foundations that are devoted to cancer research, et cetera. I mean, you, know, you can make an argument, is what I'm saying. Um, maybe a tougher argument on Murdoch. <laughs> but the, the last recipient was Sylvester Stallone. But these are supposed to be iconic, exceptional recipients, and now they will not be recipients of anything since the ceremony has been canceled. So it's a good day, sir. <laughs> right. We'll show you. We'll just cancel the whole thing. So that's the latest on RBG and the the Mark Thompson show. The award there. Uh, I've got a pretty hefty law and disorder. Again, if you're just joining us, David K. Johnston, the Pul Pulitzer Prize winner and investigative giant, joins us in the second hour. And we'll talk to David about um, everything going on with Trump and money. David predicted this long ago. He said there's no way. He's been saying this for years, that Trump doesn't have the money, and this is all BS. In mm -hmm. fact, he thought, I th and Kim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I thought David had mentioned that he expected the very real possibility of Trump declaring bankruptcy of some kind to, you know, uh, I want to ask him about that. But I'm told that... You, bankruptcy doesn't affect a court judgment like this. Okay, well, I, I'll ask. So, um, I don't know, yeah. If I don't, please remind me to ask. We'll, we'll get do. into, again, as I had mentioned, the addition of Paul Manafort potentially to the uh, Trump world, and we'll talk to David about all of those things. Uh, Wes, I want to acknowledge you. Thank you for the super sticker. Shout out. Big shout out. Yeah, $5 super sticker. Um, Luis with a $5 super Big chat. Big shout out. Hideous how that drop will get smoked by the classic that inspired a beloved wine. Yes, well, yelling? if you've just yeah. joined us, uh, Hideous is the uh, Simon drop. The image is hideous. Hideous. <laughs> and Albert and I both, I have to confess, really like Hideous. But, of course, why are you yelling? Why are you yeah. yelling? Is, it's a classic. Uh, as right. Louise said, it inspired yeah. the entire thing. So, right now, why are you yelling is winning 95% of the votes online. This is Mark's Madness Round 5. You can vote live in the chat. Rampage Radio SF! Big shout out. Big shout out. Thank you for the 10 spot. Uh, we're crowdfunded, so we try to make a big deal out of people who, uh, who do the funding. The people in the crowd who do the funding on a crowdfunded show... We make a big deal out of. That's why we run everybody's name at the end of the show who is part of our PayPal and Patreon crew. That's the community that sustains this show. And without you, we go away, honestly. We can't afford these. Uh, uh, just no way to. Everybody's working for less, but we, we've got to at least be able to make payroll. So uh, S. Blumenstein says, yes, Johnson said that, and he thought the T-man would declare personal bankruptcy. So let's ask him, Kim, when yeah. David gets here about that. You know, I think March 12th was the deadline for him to do that, as I recall from David's comments. 
And that's in um, just about a half hour. Just about a half hour we'll have uh, David joining. Um, I have a really substantial law and disorder that includes Apple and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Jefferson Graham on Text Tuesday, he's going to move along here, and he has some good stuff, too, about buying a car online and more. And then, as I say, David in the next hour, and then the latter part of the next hour brings in Alexandra Shekovich. She's a research manager at the Environmental Integrity Project. What do they do? Well, what she's doing is commenting on a new report that they have that 64% of plastics and plastics plants built or expanded since 2012 got subsidies totaling $9 billion, and then 84% of them violated air pollution limits. So they're getting our money, and then they are polluting our air, violating the basic limits. As you know, I think the limits are low everywhere, I mean, mm -hmm. the, it, meaning they're not rigorous enough. Uh, but 84%, in other words, virtually all of them, violated air pollution limits. We'll talk to her about that. And, I mean, dangerous, often illegal air pollution being generated by the very plants that we're underwriting with our tax dollars. So that's the second hour. I know, fun, right? A lot of laughs. Yep, well, I'm just uh, telling you. Hey, the party's over, everybody, okay? The country's disintegrating. Come here. We'll, get, we'll have some laughs along the way. Yes, thank you. You got to get active. You got to get out there. You got to care. You got to connect. Yeah. Uh, now, Kim's news. Then we'll slip some law and disorder in and Jefferson Graham. Smash the like button if you would Smash for me. Smash it with your iron rod. Smash it with your iron rod. If I can, in addition to updating Mark's Madness and everything else that we're doing, I do have a couple of obits. And I know you're thinking, oh, that's a real downer. People, Yeah, it's a downer, but... What these people did, I promise you, no other show is talking about these losses. This, these were extraordinary people with infamy attached to one of them and fame and having created something on the internet that has revolutionized movies. I will get to both of those things today, I promise. Even if I have to run long, I will, okay? So hold me to that. Smash the like Smash button like a boss. With your iron rod. And uh, Kim's news, and then all those things I just mentioned. <laughs> Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. This report sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee.com. Primary elections are taking place in five states today. This comes as both President Biden and former President Trump have already passed their respective parties' delegate thresholds. Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, and Ohio are all holding their elections. It looks like Congress will avoid a partial government shutdown after all. Congressional leaders striking a deal with the White House on a bill to fund the Department of Homeland Security, which was a major sticking point in negotiations to pass six major spending bills by Friday night's deadline. House Speaker Mike Johnson announced the deal today, adding the House and the Senate will take up the legislation as soon as possible. Also on Capitol Hill, the top generals who oversaw the deadly withdrawal of Afghanistan are testifying before Congress. Former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley and former Central Command, uh, Commander General Kenneth McKenzie are taking questions from the House Foreign Affairs Committee today. Thirteen American service members were killed in a terrorist attack at the Kabul airport in 2021. Police, so sad, police in Wisconsin say they found the blanket of a missing three-year-old child in this horrible case. Police in Two Rivers didn't say when that was, but investigators say the blanket was found about four miles away from the apartment that Elijah View was last seen at or in. Elijah's mother and her boyfriend remain in jail on neglect charges in that case. A former advisor to Donald Trump 
is reporting to prison. Peter Navarro turned himself into a Miami prison today to begin serving his four-month-long prison sentence. Navarro was convicted of contempt of Congress last year for failing to comply with the subpoenas issued by the Democratic-led House Committee investigating the attack on the U.S. Capitol. And before turning himself in, Navarro took the chance to speak at a uh, bank of microphones, calling the case against him an unprecedented assault on the constitutional separation of powers. I watched that, actually. That's uh, I I just was curious what he was going to say. And uh, it was, you know, kind of typical. And it was also there's just one thing that they all do when they're talking about their fearless leader, Trump. They call him with this middle name, Donald John Trump. If this Why can happen to that? me and anyone who's associated with Donald John Trump, they all speak as though they're Shakespearean actors. <laughs> then the very fabric of this great country can, is being threatened and Donald John Trump is being threatened. It's like, okay, uh, you know, let's get that four months started. Why do they do that? Uh, they're grandstanding before they're, you know, yeah. right? They're, it's the, I'm they're, they're just less than, Navarro particularly is a smack talker. I mean, and and that was what really got him into trouble. He smack talked. He actually talked about the plan to overturn the election. He talked about it on MSNBC, <sighs> and uh, it was. Uh, but but of course, the reason he's going to prison is not nothing about talking about the plan. The reason he went to prison and he's now in prison is because he defied the subpoena, and everybody's you know all those. Kids who were around Trump, Bannon, et cetera, they all flipped Congress the bird. They didn't show up. And chief among them, perhaps, Navarro. And as a result, he's going to prison. Yeah. As they say, sayonara, sucker. (laughs) Sayonara, sucker! (laughs) Oakland is taking action as business and restaurants shut down because of crime. Mayor Sheng Tao promises to improve the Hagenberger Corridor, which leads to Oakland International Airport, where more than 10 million people travel in and out of Oakland every year. She joined other city leaders yesterday to update changes. Six officers and one sergeant are now patrolling the area on foot, and the sheriff's office is launching surveillance cameras running 24 hours a day. The CHP will also continue to conduct surge operations in that area. You know, people get a little ugly when the last will and testament comes around. There's this woman from West Hills who stole nearly $3.9 million in a forged will scheme who's now been sentenced to 20 years in prison. Prosecutors say the woman forged power of attorney documents involving people who had died. She also, this is where she really crosses the line, dismembered (laughs) and disposed of the body of one of her victims. Yeah, you're right. It's pretty bad, but I love that that's what you're right. (laughs) All right, you've crossed a couple of lines here. Right. You took the money, but the whole dismembering thing, dismembering well, thing that is really a little uh, too where you've far. really yeah, you've lost me. That was very inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last year, this woman pleaded guilty to a federal charge of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. A judge has also ordered her to pay back all of the money that she stole. Wow. Well, the- it was wrong. It was stupid. And I'm trying to be a better person. <laughs> I don't person. think any apology is going to get you off the off the hook here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, In the city of Oakley, in the East Bay, a sea lion is back where it belongs, thanks to two Oakley police officers. They rescued the animal Sunday night after it wandered onto a roadway. Neighbors helped move it off to the side as officers struggled to get the sea lion into the back of the patrol car. You're under arrest. Yes. They finally did, though, and then they set it free at a, at a local marina. They tried to call the Marine Mammal Center, but I guess they couldn't come out. So they ended up setting the sea lion back into the water. Police posted photos on Facebook writing, see, we're not lying when we say Oakley Police is the best department around. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. see, we're not lying. Get yeah, it? get it? You get it. It's uh, right. I know. Okay. We I... see you, Oakley Police Department. We yeah. hear you. This report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee dot com. Mm. Today I have the hibiscus tea in the mug. It's fantastic. So good. What do you have in there? This is the Elgato Espresso. Oh, Elgato today. I like it. Dark Mm. and mysterious. The cat. All right. Mm. Well, 
uh, as Mark sips his coffee and I sip my hibiscus tea, just know it is the most kind of the most lovely coffee I was going to say, but the biggest treat that you can do for yourself. You get this wonderful Coachella Valley coffee order on your porch and it feels like the happiest day of the week. Ah, Check God. it out at CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Enter Mark T at checkout and get your 10% off CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. I'm Kim McAllister and this is The Mark Thompson Show. <laughs> They had to close down an entire radio station to silence him. And now, he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Thompson. Smash it with your iron rod. I come from regular stock. There's a reason that this place is fun. Don't ever use that word. What are the porn stars doing, Mark? They pay me a lot of money for having attitude. What you say is the political dogma that they're trying to shove down our throats. Say that right in, no problem. What the hell is going on in the United States of America? Quattro años más. I don't wear a mask for the same reason I don't wear underwear. Things gotta breathe. Say what? Do you have a secret talent? You get nothing! Y'all can all go to hell and I'm going back to Texas. Out of time. Bye-bye. Did you really just do that? Yeah, right on, everybody. Right on, right on, right on. Excited. Excited to be in the middle of one of my favorite things. Now, Mark's Madness. Mark's Madness. There's your update. Why are you yelling is crushing Simon's hideous. But again, you can vote until midnight tonight. So it's either... Why are you yelling? Why are you yelling or... The image is hideous. Hideous. Again, it's either... Why are you yelling? Or the... The image is hideous. Hideous. All right, you vote now this hour live in the chat, but in the community section of our YouTube channel, you vote until midnight tonight. Good luck. Now, uh, is is Jeff here, or what's our story? Mm. I ask you, Tony, I guess would be maybe... Either. Thanks, Tony. No, no Jefferson yet. Okay, great. So uh, that's actually not a bad thing. Um, I will ask you whether you'd like me to. This is uh, oftentimes a, a favorite moment where there's a fork in the road on the show, and I ask you, Kim, and I ask you, Tony. Tony, the sleepless magician. He's been working all night, and he still shows up to this show. Would you rather Law and Disorder, or would you rather the fascinating obits People we've lost. Just I have two of them. And I might have time for one before Jeff gets here. Uh, I ask you, Tony. Let's do obituaries. Lots of stories. Thanks, Tony. Let's do are, that. You, are you on board with that, Kim? I concur, yes. All Kim, right. how are you? All right. Uh, then uh, we will do it. Uh, here's some uh, interesting, I think you'll find obituaries the mark thompson show ed mintz has passed away my friends ed mintz who was ed mintz he created the cinema score you know how you have rotten tomatoes and yeah. you know you look to see online metacritic is another one how people reacted to a movie or now it's television or streaming etc he was a mathematician and he created an exit polling system for movies. It was called Cinema Score. Okay. It asked people leaving theaters 
on opening nights to grade the movies they'd just seen. It was a precursor to Rotten Tomatoes, which aggregates and scores critics' opinions, right? Ah, uh, okay. And he was a film buff. He was a partner in a computerized billing service. And when he and his wife went to see a comedy, it was written by Neil Simon. It's the actual first time that he had the moment. It was called The Cheap Detective, this, uh, this comedy, mm -hmm. uh, starring Peter Falk. They both didn't like it. And they felt that critics had praised it, and they wanted some way that their voice could be heard, mm -hmm. people who didn't like the movie. Because normally at that time, it seems a weird thing now. It's so much a part of the landscape of the internet, opinion, and how many stars does it have, et cetera. But at that time, there was none of that. So they were talking to a couple of other moviegoers at that same film, and he got this idea. And a year later, he came up with this idea to create, essentially, cinema score. And he actually, <laughs> he came up with the idea at a Yum Kipper service. A year later, he's, si he's, so he's sitting with this idea the whole year, like, oh, I've got to figure out something. I don't and think he the, was thinking about the, uh, the service at that he point. <laughs> His well, mind was elsewhere. I guess after the service, he looked at a donation pledge guard, a, a card is what he said. Mm -hmm. And rather than write with a pen or pencil, because I guess apparently you're prohibited if you're an observant Jewish person from doing that on Yom Kippur, on using a pen or a pencil. I mean, I think oh. it's supposed to be, uh, at least that's what it's noted here. Okay. Um, so they indicated people did worshipers that they would make a donation by bending this perforated tab and he said i almost jumped out of my chair i thought simple how simple he quickly came up with the cinema score ballot card which he tested by sending employees of his business to a few theaters when the testing phase ended polling began this is all the way back in 1979. There it is. Thank you for hustling that, Tony. The card and the polling process have changed little since these first days, and they created a crowdsourcing alternative to critics' opinions. There's six categories. Grade, gender, age, and reasons for attending, etc. Anyway, he passes away, and he leaves behind what essentially is a system by which all of us consult and contribute to our opinions through Rotten Tomatoes, through Metacritic, and all the rest. Wow. So Ed Mintz, at 83, passes away. Do I have Jeff yet, or do I have time for the yes. other? Yeah. I will hold off on the second one. The second obituary, which I promise you can sift through all of YouTube, and you will not find any other show talking about it. I will tell you, uh, and this is a significant event that this guy was associated with, and he's a lawyer. That's the only clue I'm going to give, and he's not American. I'll give, uh, okay, but huge event, and I will share that with you before the end of the show. And if we have to run long for me to get it in, I will get it in. Anyway, that's uh, still to come. The Mark Thompson Show. He is the former tech writer for USA Today. He does Photo Walks TV. He's so kind to drop in on Tuesdays. We consider him family here on the show. He's Jefferson Grant. Hi. Hi. How you doing? Well, you've got a lot of compliments because you relit this studio, and I'm using these in-ear uh, headphones, which I'm not crazy for right now, just because they don't fit in the ear super well. But um, uh, that wasn't your idea. That's just I just want to show you all the ways that we're evolving. Uh, yeah, here. But I so love the new look. I really do. Um, I uh, would love the kind of darker, mysterious look that Jefferson Graham has, Tony. How come I don't have... You see how his background is kind of muted and dark and mysterious? 
I mean, we could paint your walls black. Uh, gray, <laughs> gray. Okay. So I had, a friend, gray, okay? I, I had a friend of mine <laughs> told me that if I painted the wall gray, I could splash colors on it, all sorts of colors. And, and and it would photograph well, which is cool. And, I, you know, for a while I was doing purples and reds and, and stuff like that. Then I decided I just like the black look, the gray, the black look. So that's I kind of I kind of do, too, Tony. Maybe I do want to go with a gray look. I don't know. I All we have look. to do, Mark, is uh, paint your blinds. Yeah, I do. Would you let's get I'll come over. Tony, I, Tony and I are a team. We'll do it together. Don't don't volunteer Tony for another job. He already has too many. He can barely make it. Uh, but anyway, thank you for upgrading us, and it is a work in progress. So, um, what do you have for us today, pal? I'm talking about scams for people that are trying to sell their used car. I'm going through this experience right now. It is terrible. And um, there are all these vultures out there on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, next door that are, are pouncing and trying to um, basically scam you out of your car, out of your money, out of your everything. Well, how and, does the scam work? Okay, here's the basic gist. I, I have a Hyundai Elantra. I'm not here to sell it, but I have a Hyundai Elantra. It's 12 years old. I'm asking $5,000. The blue book is five to 6,500. Excuse Period. me for a second. Is Jefferson loud enough, Tony, to you? It seems okay. I'm sorry to ask that, but I just, he seems a little low to me, but okay. Am I loud enough? No, no, it's, uh, it's not your fault. I just was okay. very curious. I'm okay. so, on this end. so you have this Elantra. So saying. Elantra, new car sells for $30,000. I'm asking for five. So now, first of all, every email I get is, I'll give you 2000 I'll give you a thousand. Uh, I want the car. I want the car sight unseen. Uh, I'll give you 50 bucks. I mean, it's just like nonstop. Then you get the, I want the car and I want it today. Um, can, can I have your phone number so I can call you? And you say, sure. And then once they start texting, cause they're not calling, they say, look, I just want to give you a six digit code to confirm that your listing is legit. Just, I'm going to send you the numbers and you type it in. Well, I'm a savvy person. And the first thing I do is I look it up before I type anything in and I find the scam. I feel bad for the people that aren't doing it, who aren't on top of things, because once you type in that code, goodbye, goodbye. They take control of your phone and they get everything. And that's one of the scams. Wait one second. Yes. Someone can have me type a code into them. You type oh. it into your phone, and okay, that is I type a code. It into my phone. It's a and code. that is a code for them to now take control of your phone what? and get access I mean, to again, everything. Where's my Oprah when I need her? I mean, what? Thank you. I, I I can't understand. You're telling me all phones have this feature whereby if I put in a five digit code somebody else can take control of the phone just like if i sent you an email and said click this link dummy and then you click the link and i now take control of your computer that's john podesta okay john podesta was hillary clinton's manager this is what eight years ago now for uh for uh 2016 right 2016 so eight yeah. years ago um your google needs to be updated click this link he clicked the link and Voila. That's how everything, how she got hacked. It, it, it seems like an extraordinary, uh, I, and I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it does seem as though with what is general usership that's not super acquainted with the highly technical nature, even yourself, as you say, you double checked it, but you, you had to double check because it just seemed weird to you. You didn't know the scam ahead of time. You no, had to I never check. heard of it. Because it seems with most of the usership not being that sophisticated that they would eliminate that possibility that you know you could somehow just enter these digits into your phone and some other a hole in you know I don't yeah. know where gets to take over your device. Right. Some person supposedly named Janet who lives near me wants to buy my car today and wants to meet and you know there's not a Janet and and she doesn't live locally. And uh, I, my ears were just attuned to it, but I can only imagine a lot of other people who aren't. And, and Mark, that's one of the scams. The other one is, do you accept Zelle, PayPal, or Venmo? That's the other one, because they have phony accounts that can then steal all your money and your car at the same time. 
And how do the phony accounts work? I mean, I, I understand what a phony account is, but okay, how do they steal? I'm not money? really sure. All I know is they said, you'll take Zelle, PayPal, or Venmo, please. And then I looked up, why don't you take that for a used car purchase? And it said, because they can give you funny money, uh, fake accounts, they can do all sorts of things. Wow. And so that's why you say cash or cashier's check, which then begs the question, well, maybe they're giving you counterfeit money, right? Well, that's just but a lot. Facebook well, a marketplace. Check, a cashier's check. I was burned on that once on eBay. Really? Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy, and it was many years ago. And of course, this is how when you're not used to this entire thing, this is kind of what I'm talking about. When you're new to it all, you're not aware of the fact that these cashier checks are the easiest. It's this is the oldest scam in the world. I'm going to send you a, a check for you're selling something this is exactly what happened to me uh i'm selling it was living room furniture i think for whatever twelve hundred dollars he said i'm going to send you um a cashier's check and it arrives and it's for three thousand dollars he said oh uh, yeah I'll tell you what right. just right. you get it right deposit yeah. the three thousand and you can just send me back the change you know just and of course you get to the cashier then you look around ebay and it says <laughs> everywhere don't take cashier checks don't take cashier checks so as a okay. seller, if you're sophisticated at all, you know this. But if you're new, you get sucked in. So those are two of the scams you're talking yeah, about. Where that to. happened to me was a wedding, because I'm a photographer. Um, how much do you charge? $1,000. Fine, I'll give you 3000 uh, And I said, no, no, don't. And then all of a sudden, these um, postal orders, what do they call them? Uh, you get them at the post office. Uh, sure. Postal um, mail orders or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Order. So they send yeah. me $3,000 worth of stuff of this stuff. And I go to the post office. I said, here, take it. I don't want it. And they said, oh, those are all phony. Well, thank you. I know it. Um, and so then I start getting the notes. Please uh, deduct the stuff and send me a postal order, blah, 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 blah. Um, oh. to, to, you haven't asked the question, but why don't you just go to CarMax? Why don't you go to a car dealer? Which is what everyone's been telling me because they give you very little. They give you very little, and uh, so I wanted to get more. But at this point, um, I think I'm just giving it to charity because uh, I, I can't take it anymore. So uh, that's uh, what I think uh, I'm going to but, do. But, but you have the, 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 reason for, you, the reason for CarMax, I'm sorry, is just because... They, they pay half of what everybody else pays in see. private parties if you can withstand the pain of going through all these hacks. You're just giving away too much in your, in your judgment. Yeah, right. Wow. It's so wild. I mean, CarMax is such a hot thing. I'm surprised that, you know. Uh, they supposedly would give me $2,000. And again, the blue book is five to 6,500. This is an ongoing story, everybody. I want to follow the progress of this car. You really think you might just give it away? I think I'm going to give it to uh, PBS or the Cancer Society or something. Uh, the deal there is you give them the car, they sell it. When they sell it, they send you a receipt and you use that as a tax write-off. And I'm leaning heavily in that direction. So my mom had a car. It was a French car, a Peugeot. And my mother is a Francophile, longtime uh, French teacher and you know studied at La Sorbonne, all that stuff. So she loves things that are French. So she loves saying Peugeot. Mark, do you want to use the Peugeot? When I was growing up, it was always that, okay? You never just call it the car. It was always the Peugeot. So it had been around forever. And, of course, she's having to take it to some special guy friend with a French accent and a white coat who was just going to charge my mother more and more. And a to beret. Keep, this, yeah. keep this, this hunk of metal running. So finally, we prevailed upon her, and she did what you were talking about. She gave it away. She said, oh, I've just given it away. And this car it had all these bumper stickers on it, you know, women's rights and, you know, women's right to choose. And she's, a, you know, got the good liberal sort of bumper sticker offerings on everywhere. So it's, you can't miss this car is the point. So I'm going home to visit my mom and dad. She's given away the car. I'm anxious to see her new car. And I pull up and there is the Peugeot. And it's parked across the street. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she just will not let go of that car. But no, she gave the car to the people across the street. So she's always able to look out the window every morning and see that all is right of the, is with the world. They are loving that car. It was for their teenager who they needed to get a car for. And so the teenager is driving the Peugeot. So I'm saying to you, Jefferson Graham, maybe there's a teenager on your block 
who would benefit from your vehicle and yeah you in around. our neighborhood we don't have a lot of teenagers we have a lot of babies so maybe in a I few see. years in a yeah. few years okay well and so much for that went through that whole story to try to encourage you to look in your neighborhood and apparently i that's think i'm doing i'm going to do charity okay good um jefferson graham's photo walks is i believe you're in was it oceanside yeah i was going to say san diego thank you oceanside okay yeah oceanside yeah. and this weekend we're in pacifica uh, which is oh, the cool. last the last coastal city on Highway One before you get to San Francisco, and it's also a really fun place. So these shots are all done with drone. Yeah, what a cool thing this drone stuff is for photography. Yeah, really. I mean, there's these no shots in <laughs> in our lifetime. You used to have to have a helicopter to get shots like this, right? Or a big ladder, <laughs> <laughs> a movable ladder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the drones that you are using for these various things, do you just go with one or how many do you take? I have you? one. It's the DJI Mini 4. And uh, it's really cool. I bought it on December 30th. Um, folks who live in, um, in, in California, remember there was the King Tides at the end of December. And they were really massive waves. And I was flying my old drone over one of the waves. And I said, let's go get a close up. And I got too close and the ocean ate my drone. So I went and bought a new one. Well, the stuff you have is just gorgeous. I, I thought this, oh, oh, there it is. Look, Tony's got it uh, going there. I feel like this is, the drone is the really the thing like Tony would dig on. He's kind of an audio guy, but he loves techie stuff like this. Maybe Tony, uh, Tony and I will, will go in together on a drone. You know what I mean? He, we can split our time. You know, well, you can you have know, it on weekends, I'll have it during the week. <laughs> I think it, it's a, it looks like a really fun thing. It is a lot of fun, yeah. It also seems like it's easy to lose because for the reasons that you suggested. So. Yes, but the, it's, uh, you know, you, you think about the most amazing inventions of the, the technological age and most, I would usually say the iPhone, which changed our life. But how about a flying camera that you yeah. can click a button and say, come back to me, I don't know where you are. And it shows up. It's That's, unbelievable. That, it's just wild. And of course, then the dark side of it, it's being used in war in more and more ways. And But you're right, the uh, the recreational aspects of it and the artistic aspects of this technological innovation, spectacular. So, hey, find him on YouTube. Uh, well, there it is, Photo Walks TV. It's the YouTube series. And of course, his Substack is jeffersongram.substack.com. We've shown you only a glimpse of everything he's got going. He is the great Jefferson Graham. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Bye bye. The Mark Thompson Show. You'll tell me when David K. Johnston arrives. Will you not, guys? David is here. Uh, and uh, you can probably take that Jefferson Graham banner off, I would guess, right around now, since he's just left us. Um, I will take then a quick news break. Then we have David K. Johnston. Does that sound about right? Will that work, Kim, do you think? Do you, can we? Keep an eye on the door to see when Jeff, uh, whether when... Um, oh, David K. Johnston is when here. When David K. Johnston and arrives. I would do news, but there's oh, yes. so much Trumpy Trump stuff to get to that I'd go right to Mr. Johnston. No, 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 no. If I was waiting on David. Yeah, oh, he's yeah, yeah. here. Thank you. We yeah. can, well, okay, great. Okay, terrific. Mm -hmm. So uh, without any further delay... Um, you know, the Mark Thompson Show. I have a one piece of business to do before David. It'll only take 30 seconds. Let me just make sure that I've got it uh, lined up the way I need to. And uh, I had a couple of listener questions for David K. Johnston, too. I want to make sure that I have uh, those ready to go. Um, yes, uh, here it is. Now, I can't believe it. Mark's Madness. It's our two of Mark's Madness in this round. And again, you'll vote right now live in the chat either for... Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Or you'll uh, vote for... What the hell is going on in the United States of America? Uh, that's Ron. So it's either... Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Or you'll vote for the great Ron Owens. What the hell is going on in the United States of America? You vote live in the chat and until midnight tonight in the community section of our YouTube channel. And good luck. The Mark Thompson Show. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist whose books are absolute page turners. You can crack them open almost literally to any page. And there's an amazing story and he shows his math. And when it comes to Trump, I think he's done three books on Trump. And 
uh, one is better than the one before. It's just uh, remarkable. How about it for David K. Johnston? Hello, Mark. Hello, Good sir. You. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, great to see you. You're everywhere now. Wow, you've met your moment. Uh, uh, literally, <laughs> I think it's going to get it's, busier going forward. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's true. That's true. Well, you're the Trumpologist, and Trump is uh, super relevant. Now, I want to go back. A couple of listeners wrote in to us about this uh, to ask you about the notion of bankruptcy when it comes to yeah. Donald Trump. You had spoken of it once before. Yeah, well, I was the one who first raised this. Um, Donald has never filed personal bankruptcy. In 1990, he avoided it because he got the New Jersey casino regulators to take his side against his bankers. And the bankers all realized that uh, they were going to be very badly hurt unless they uh, knuckled under. It was totally inappropriate and improper, but that's Trump's sort of magic to get other people to do his, his foul doing. Uh, when he had a publicly traded casino company, it went bankrupt. It went bankrupt four times, didn't pay lots of bills, but Donald extracted a minimum of eighty-three million dollars from. It. That's how much he had to disclose. He undoubtedly took more money through expenditures that were covered as uh, <clears throat> business matters, uh, like use of his plane. Um, after that, the company went bankrupt. He was basically paid to go away. Um, it went bankrupt under um, uh, Carl um, Icahn twice, and then it went out of business. Uh, if Donald were to file bankruptcy, he would get an automatic stay of both the E. Jean Carroll case and the New York State fraud case. The stay is 45 days, but I point out that Alex Jones, the just completely crazy tinfoil fat, uh, tin hat uh, conspiracy theorist, you know, interdimensional beings have taken over our leaders. Um, he's gone more than two years without paying the Sandy Hook uh, folks who uh, he owes a billion and a half dollars to, way more than he's worth, but he has a lot of money. He did that so, by shifting money around primarily? Well, we, yeah, I mean, we don't know exactly, but his lawyers have done a good job of delay, delay, delay. And, and uh, knowing who Alex Jones is, yeah, he's probably in various ways moved money that a bankruptcy court could go after him for. Um, uh, and the families would like to get this over with. Um, so uh, Donald's, if Donald were to file bankruptcy, it would be entirely a strategic move. It will not save him from paying the judgments eventually because they're going to be all upheld on appeal. There might be some peel back, you know, the 83.3 million to uh, e. Jean Carroll for defaming her yet again, um, a court might go, ah, it's too much. Let's make it $60 million. That's not going to be material to what's happening to Donald. And so Donald's entire focus is November 5th. Either he gets back in the White House on November 5th, or it's all over. So, And what difference does it make at that point? Because eventually he'll go to prison. So to summarize, the personal bankruptcy wouldn't serve him sufficiently to address his concerns at the moment. It, oh, no, no, no. Personal bankruptcy would stop all these proceedings. Right. I, I thought you had mentioned March. When did you mention March 12th? I thought was March 20, well, March 12th was the deadline for the E. Jean Carroll case, and he got a bond. I see. Uh, he didn't. It, it was misreported widely that uh, he posted the bond. He had proffered the bond, and then he posted it inside legal nonsense. Okay. Um, now he has until Monday next week, the 25th, to put up cash or a bond or to persuade the Intermediate Court of Appeals in New York to allow him to put up less. And courts have done this from time to time. Um, the court also can just sit on his application and do nothing. Uh, so th that's a real deadline day. But it, the real important part of this is not so much his strategy here, delay everything, his ability to, if he does file bankruptcy, he could sell that to his true believers easily. You know, the corrupt Marxist fascists, they made me do this. Um, that the, the, His followers will, you know, who think he's God, uh, they'll, they'll go along with this. His, his problem is getting to November 5th. And if he files bankruptcy, my guess is lawyers will find ways to delay and argue. And unless he gets a really tough bankruptcy judge or bankruptcy trustee who the judge appoints, um, 
he'll he'll get past November 5th. But at the end of the day, it's all going to fall apart. It's always been a house of cards. And now it's going to fall apart. And just keep this simple fact in mind, folks. Donald Trump repeatedly said in the summer of 2015, I'm worth more than $10 billion. And now he's out scrapping for $5 donations from low-income Republicans. The other thing that we have heard is right about that. I mean, heard from listeners and viewers who wanted me to ask you, how is it that he can claim in court that he is worth all of this money? I mean, what's noted here in one email is 800 million. He has access to cash of $800 million. Apparently, he noted that under oath. And now, not have the money. Isn't that some kind of perjury or adjacent legal violation? Well, let me correct the record. It's $400 million that he said he had a year ago. Not okay. 800 million, 400 uh, I didn't believe when he said it then, uh, just like I never believed that he was even a billionaire. And, um, you know, I talked to two brand name multi-billionaires who both in separate interviews told me that eh, to pose as a billionaire to match their lifestyle, you'd need to spend about $20 million a year. Yeah, well, Donald certainly has $20 million a year to spend. I mean, remember, Donald Trump is not a wealth creator. Uh, he's not somebody who gets a, what you're trying to do. you got a business. You're trying to build it up, get a bigger audience, make a living, and prosper. Donald is reaching and grab the money. And when the business is collapsing, then you walk away and say, oh, you know, the market changed or these terrible regulators or something like that. Uh, now, Debbie asks here in the thing, why doesn't he sell something? Well, it's pretty hard to arrange the sale of something, enough things worth a half a billion dollars in a matter of days. Uh, secondly, this is not a good time to be selling real estate because interest rates are up. If he he knew this was coming for a long time, if he had sold some things earlier when interest rates were lower, he might be in a much better position today. He has existing mortgages on properties, and those are what are called cross collateralized based on his past experience of things that were in the public record. So that you know, you have a credit card. If you read the fine print, you know, those 16 pages of tiny type, you need a magnifying glass to read. Somewhere in there, it will say that if you default, that is, you fail to make timely payments on a different credit card, all your balance on that credit card can be immediately called and they can seize your bank account to get payment. And so Donald has covenants. We know he has covenants that require him to maintain a certain net worth, to retire, maintain a certain cash balance. And he's all tied up in, the, in these various things. And he's always been able to pull another scam and reach out somewhere. But, you know, he's at the end of the road about this now. And uh, assuming that the Democrats uh, don't screw up again and they put their effort into the 13 states that can go for Biden or for Trump in the Electoral College, where all they have to do is get people registered and then get people to the polls on voting day. Um, at the end, things will fall apart for Trump. If the Democrats do what they often do, they, you know, think we're so great, we don't have to explain what we're doing and we don't have to get our hands dirty. Then Donald Trump goes back to the White House. It's the end of our democracy. And he will use his presidential powers to get rid of all of these problems as best he can. He may not be able to get rid of the state problems if he's been convicted already in the states then he can't do anything about that. If he hasn't been tried yet, he'll get courts to say he can't try him. He's a sitting president. But keep this in mind. I was the first person to say this. And within two days, all sorts of law professors and, and practicing prosecutors were saying I was right. Nothing in our Constitution would prevent a convicted felon serving time in prison from being and serving as president of the United States. We could literally end up with Donald Trump in a military stockade somewhere uh, the state of New York might put him in, and he's president. I, the thought is, oh, it's is crazy. Wild. And I also want to have, maybe for our next conversation, because I want to double back to the money here in a second, uh, a conversation with you about the other things that happen during an election and the plans as articulated by Bannon to sort of throw a monkey wrench even into the certification in various counties uh, nationwide, you know. Um, will, will Donald Trump ever go to jail, in your opinion, Michael? Is yeah, you. no, I, I, <clears throat> I believe he will go to prison eventually. Hmm. And if he's convicted in the effort to overthrow the government, the sentence is there. That is the biggest criminal prosecution in the history of this country. 
Uh, the sentences there have been very proportionate. There are a couple of websites that track this. Well, the biggest leaders, uh, the Proud, Le uh, Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, they each got more than 20 years. Donald's convicted in that case. He will absolutely get a, a sentence of more than 20 years. He turned 78 years old in June. That's a, that's a life sentence. I wanted to have you weigh in on this apparent media storm that's emerged around the bloodbath comments that yeah. uh, Donald Trump made. And and I wonder before you comment, David, Tony, can you play? I just want, because a lot of this is about, well, it was context and context and context. I want people to actually see the entire thing. It's only about two minutes. Can you run it, Tony, please? Business in our country. Think of it. Went to Mexico. China now is building a couple of massive plants where they're going to build the cars in Mexico and think, they think, that they're going to sell those cars into the United States with no tax at the border. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line and you're not going to be able to sell those guys if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're building massive factories. A friend of mine, all he does is build car manufacturing plants. He's the biggest in the world. I mean, honestly, I joke about it. He can't. OK, that's walk fine. We've seen enough. But you got it there. Go ahead, David. Well, first of all, I hope some journalists go find out who is it who builds the biggest plants in the world and see if Donald Trump knows him, because I don't think there is such a person. It's like no all his calls, friends No one died. calls out the Trump BS like David K. Johnston it, it, does. It's like all the friends he had who died on 9-11, not one of whose funerals he went to, and those mythical uh, Muslims in New Jersey who were dancing in the streets. Um, but it, it, the context of this conversation is is very important, and it's been badly reported. So let me deal with the first part. Uh, Donald Trump got us to redesign NAFTA. We replaced NAFTA with the updated um, uh, Can-Am-Mex agreement or Mex-Can-Am or however it goes agreement that changed the tariff rules. So what Donald Trump is complaining about is his administration's decision to change the rules. And he, if, if you listen to the whole thing, he's blaming Biden. Uh, secondly, it doesn't matter who builds the cars in Mexico. American companies build cars in Mexico. Uh, Germ I, I don't know if the Germans do, but Americans certainly do. And so that doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Um, he would have to get uh, Congress to go along with what he's proposing. And it isn't aimed at, at Mexico. And finally, here's the key thing he's proposing. Let's assume a car you buy in Mexico is uh, $40,000. The average price of a new car now is almost $40,000. With sales tax, it is. He's going to double it to 80000 So listen, if you think you're going to need to buy a car in the future, you better go buy one now if you think Trump's going to the White House and he can pull that off because you're going to pay $80,000 for another car. Uh, because domestic manufacturers, they're going to raise their prices. A tariff is a tax on consumers. China doesn't pay anything. Mexico doesn't pay anything. It's paid entirely by consumers, and it allows domestic manufacturers to raise their price Economic theory says to $1 below what the tariff cost of an imported car is. So American company sells their car for $79,999, and they'll do fine. They decide to sell it for $78,000. they are going to make this unbelievable profit off a car they were going to sell for less than forty. dollars And it's that's Donald Trump. He wants to pick your pocket because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, the other part of this is the bloodbath comment. If Donald Trump really didn't mean to suggest violence, as he now maintains, why does he use violent phraseology? Uh, you know, it, this is a dog whistle to those people who want to commit violence. He, the problem he's got with trying to stoke violence, we've got a thousand people already who've, who've been indicted. Most of them have been convicted and sent to prison. And a lot of them are going to sit there for years. Some of them that were relatively minor invaders of the Capitol are done. But how many people knowing that the government is seriously going to go after people who try to overthrow our government 
are going to say, yeah, I'm going to go ruin my life. I'm going to follow Donald Trump. It doesn't matter. I'm going to lose my career, my house, my family. It doesn't matter. Donald's more important. I want to go to prison for Donald. There's some people out there who will do that, but there are not many of them. It's interesting that you say this because maybe it does dovetail with something I wanted to, you know, make an agenda item at some point with you, and maybe we can visit it just briefly. There was a piece in Rolling Stone that I thought was interesting, and it was about essentially the uh, the plan for uh, chaos in certain counties in swing states yeah. where you could create um, enough intimidation. This is a it's a Bannon-esque plan, you know. Um, to, uh, but, but it's been articulated and it's out there, as you're aware, uh, to create enough uh, a chaos and essentially enough pressure to prevent the certification of the vote. And again, enough counties, you don't need every county, just to create uh, a vote that would leave both candidates, Trump and Biden, in critical states, short of the numbers they'd need to Pass that threshold and 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 get the electoral college votes to become president. So with neither candidate having the electoral college votes uh, required to ascend to the presidency, it would then go to the House of Representatives, and that's a Republican House because it's one state, one vote. Well, it may or may not be. Remember, the new Congress begins January third. The certification of the president is January sixth. It is the next Congress that will certify the presidential election. That yeah, may be the biggest comment on this because the uh, we had Howie Klein on yesterday was talking about the blue wave that's very possibly going to hit. Oh, I, I think it's very clear that in House races, there's going to be a huge turnover to the Democrats because you're seeing all of these Republicans who are leaving office. They don't even want to run again because they know that there's going to be a, a blue wave. Uh, uh, and so... Uh, there will definitely be efforts to disrupt elections. I don't know how successful it'll be. This is not new. From 1960 until early in this century, the Republican Party was under a federal court order not to intimidate voters, uh, walk around with guns, things like that. Uh, and then they got judges to finally to lift it. And they went right back to doing this kind of stuff. And uh, as with the Voting Rights Act that was gutted by John Glover Roberts, the Chief Justice of the United States, uh, the controls that were in place to keep white supremacists and anti-Semites and their like uh, neo-Nazis from uh, people voting that they don't like, those have been lifted. And that's going to be a problem. And it's going to be very important that lots of lawyers and other people volunteer on election day to deal with these things. You know, I noticed in the comment, um, one of the folks here said, lower gas prices under Trump. Yeah. And you know why there were lower gas prices? Because a million Americans unnecessarily died during COVID because of Donald Trump. If Donald, I, I predicted in a book I wrote in 2018, two years before, more than two years before the pandemic, if a pernicious virus like the one that killed Donald Trump's grandfather a century ago starts hopscotching around the planet on jetliners, Trump won't know what to do. If we had followed the medical advice and not this nonsense about taking horse dewormer and uh, bleach and other crazy stuff that Donald did. Uh, if we'd followed the medical advice, uh, we would have had fewer than 100,000 Americans die. And we didn't. And so, yeah, business had to slow down and stop because of how transmissible this virus was. Once it had taken out the most vulnerable population, there have been fewer deaths, but there's still lots of people dying from COVID, lots of people in hospitals and lots of people suffering long COVID who are, I mean, I have friends who are still very sick several years later and they're not necessarily my age either. Uh, so yeah, we can have gas prices the way they were in, 19, in 2020 and 2021. We just need to kill another million Americans. I mean, think this through. By the way, from the time Trump left office uh, until very recently, gas prices fell by $1.26 a gallon or $1.22 a gallon on average. Um, they've gone back up a little bit. Why? Well, there's this guy named Vladimir Putin who's pushing a war and his friends who are attacking oil tankers in the uh, Red Sea uh, and the, the Gulf of Hormuz. And uh, so, uh, you know, these are the people Donald loves. You know, MBS, uh, uh, Putin, um, uh, dictators. The... Uh the need of Donald Trump for money, David, does uh, perhaps 
lead him back to some of these people that you're talking about or countries that you're talking about. The addition of Paul Manafort <laughs> potentially to his crew. I mean, as a is, fundraiser. Yeah, exactly. As a fundraiser. Paul, Thank Paul, you. Paul Manafort was a Washington political operative. He had a nice business, you know, of fixing things for people, going to going to government agencies and finding where the pressure points were and figuring out how to shape arguments to favor his clients. And one day he started realizing he could make much more money going to work for vicious dictators and warlords overseas. And just unbelievable amounts of money they paid him. And he lived this incredible lifestyle. I mean, when they finally uh, inventoried his house in a search, you know, he had things like a, a, a multi-thousand dollar ostrich leather jacket. Yeah, and he it was, lived it was, large, man. Yeah, he it, was, like a, it, was like a, it, it looked like a hip hop video at his uh, yeah. house. Yeah. yeah. And, and Manafort was in the pocket of Putin. He was paid tens of millions of dollars. We know about at least 24 million, but I don't think that's anywhere near the total by the, the Russian puppet who was running the Ukrainian government and who built this palatial presidential palace with no authority. When there was the popular uprising in 2014 that threw him out, journalists who had been trained by investigative reporters and editors, which I'm a former president of, arrived, saw papers floating in this artificial lake in February in Ukraine, you can imagine how cold it is, and put out a call for two things, divers to dive into the lake and get every piece of paper they could, and uh, truck drivers with flash freeze trailers. Well, people came and they got all these documents and by flash freezing them, you kept the bacteria from destroying them. And there were these ledgers showing these payments to Manafort. It was Manafort who attended the meeting when the Russian em emissary came to Trump Tower in the summer of 2015 and said, the Kremlin is trying to help you defeat Hillary Clinton. Now, not only should you never take a meeting like that or lie and deny about it like Don Jr. did for more than a year until the New York Times got its hands on the emails, but there's only one thing as a patriotic American that you do if you're running for office or working on a campaign and anyone from any foreign country, even Canada or Australia, you know, our very friendly neighbors, uh, you pick up the phone, you call the FBI and you say, I need to speak to someone in counterintelligence. They didn't do that. So to bring Paul Manafort back, I mean, I hope Americans have enough memory. If you want the Kremlin to, uh, uh, you know, be in charge of your life or have heavy influence over it, you should really vote for Donald Trump. I mean, if you think that uh, we should have a, a leadership that uh, kills its opponents, jails them without cause, um, uh, reacts like Putin did when he was asked by an American TV correspondent from NBC the other day about the death of Viktor Navalny, his leading opponent, and Putin said, unfortunate, doesn't care, meaningless, because he's just a cold-blooded killer autocrat. Well, and, you know, uh, obviously it's been, you know, widely reported, and you don't even need to report it, the number of meetings he's taken with autocrats, the most recent one with Orban at Mar-a-Lago, but to, to the Putin and Manafort connection, uh, as you say, Manafort is the, he's a real pipeline to money. Uh, yeah. Could that money cure Trump's debt? I mean, by the way, this speaks to, I think you did a column on this on MS, yeah. uh, about the fact that he becomes this wild security risk, the president of the United States. He's so beholden to these uh, oligarchs or even uh, leaders of other nations like Russia that get him through this financial problem. So to explain he... this, can we just go back for a moment to 1787? The United States government is called the Articles of Confederation, and it's failing. As Adam Smith taught, all governments must tax, and it had no power to tax. So we overthrew, after the, through this con convention, it wasn't a violent overthrow. Uh, we did it by votes. The failed First Republic and set up the Second Republic primarily so we could tax ourselves. But the, fr the framers, when they agreed to have a president, an executive, were very concerned. They wanted to make sure he wasn't a king. They wanted to limit his term in office. And they wanted to make sure he was not influenced by money. So the president could not receive money from the state governments, nor from foreign governments. Now, Donald Trump just flouted that. He took in money left and right, millions of dollars from the states and foreign governments, as well as from the federal government at his businesses. He claims he disgorged the money, but there's no transparency about that. He gave Discord some money, but I don't think it's anywhere near uh, what it, what was involved. And he shouldn't have been doing this in the first place. What the framers never thought about, 
and, and I've read all the papers that are available from this time because I teach this stuff. They never had any discussion about what would we do about a president of the United States who's in debt to the king in England or uh, the czar in Russia? Um, uh, uh, well, how would we how would we address that? What if what if the queen in in Spain was owed a lot of money by the president? It never occurred to them. And now we have a president of the United States who is indebted for ninety two million dollars to a Swiss insurance company, Chubb, which operates in fifty four countries. They say that they have stopped doing business in Russia because of the invasion of Ukraine. But when I wrote about them for MSNBC's website. They still had Russia up on their website, including an announcement that we've moved our office to this location, but we have the same number phone numbers in Moscow. Um, the but in any event, it's a it's a Swiss company, and we don't know what's behind the guarantee. For all we know, some Russian oligarch or MBS in Saudi Arabia uh, said, "Hey, listen, um, uh, make him this bond, and I'll put this money over here, and if Tom doesn't pay, you can take this money." We don't know who he's really beholden to. And so, you know, we, we do not want to have a president of the United States beholden to anybody. I mean, Jimmy Carter sold his little two-bit peanut warehouse that had exactly zero ability to influence the peanut market because people thought it was corrupt that he owned a peanut warehouse. So he sold it. And he lost money, by the way, because uh, he hadn't expected to sell it, and he had to sell it in a hurry. And if Donald has to sell properties right now, he's going to take serious, serious haircut because it'll be fire sale prices. And if Letitia James gets a hold of it, she's going to do her best to maximize the money for the simple reason that she wants to get the state paid. But she's not going to get great prices for his properties either. Uh, we're out of time. I maybe next time want to follow up as a practical matter how that might happen, how the state of New York might take control, you know, padlock properties and start liquidating various Trump holdings. I mean, it stays away. Yeah, there you go. Uh, love, uh, you can find David everywhere now. I mean, <laughs> virtually everywhere you look. But MSNBC is a good place to start. And of course, dcreport.org, co-founder there, and pick up one of his books. He's just prolific all the time. David, thank you. David take K. Johnson, care, everybody. Take care. All right. Yeah, good talking to you. The Mark Thompson Show. Wow. I could just talk to that guy all day. Love it. Thank you for uh, smashing the like button like uh, like a boss, like you do. Smashed it with your iron rod. Yeah, give us a thumbs up for David K. Johnston. Love getting him in on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. The other lingering legal questions that there are are associated with matters that Trump is involved in and also the Supreme Court is involved in that have nothing to do with Trump. Of course, it is his court. You know, he essentially threw the court over to the hard right. But we'll talk with David Katz about that on Thursday. Just saw David Katz on with uh, Fox 5 in New York, you know, their local station there in New York. They're owned and operated station in New York. Last night he was there. So I'm looking forward to getting him on uh, this week uh, as well. Uh, I do have a lot to do, Kim. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, I'm in the middle of uh, everyone's favorite time of year. I no. mean, no. it's Mark. Mark's Madness. Yep. These two drops are playing off against each other. You can only vote for one. You will uh, vote for... Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Mm, yeah, George Santos or... What the hell is going on in the United States of America? Yeah, again, either... Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. George Santos or... What the hell is going on right in the United now, States of America? Ron Owens leads 65% yeah. of the vote so far. So you can vote in the community section of our YouTube channel. Again, if you go to the YouTube channel, the Mark Thompson Show. You'll see videos. You'll see live. You'll see shorts. And you'll see community Both in the community so channel, yeah. the community part of the channel. You can vote for a poll that looks just like the one that you just saw on screen. So, uh, And thank you, Tony, as always, for hustling that together. Albert is back tomorrow. The commissioner of Mark's Madness has been in Asia the entire time. I didn't approve the trip. I never would have approved that the commissioner <laughs> of the league be away during the kickoff of this most critical time. But I didn't. Uh, Why do you think he didn't ask? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was just. Um, uh, I love it when you're angry. Well, anyway. So, uh, Kim.
Yes. I have a guest. Yes. Waiting. Right. And I have your news. Can you supersize some news after the guest or like we can ask the guest to wait? It's one of the two. Well, I don't think we should ask our guest to wait because she's got some important information when it comes to companies making plastic. It's crazy. Let's get right to her. Well, and, and, then, and it's companies that are subsidized with our tax dollars, too, wild. which is what really, I think, makes Things that we didn't relevant, even so. realize. So, yeah, let's uh, let's put the news on the back burner. I have nothing breaking, so let's rock on. Okay. The Mark Thompson Show. She is... Um, research manager at the environmental integrity project and they've just come out with a report that suggests that nine billion dollars in subsidies have gone to companies 84 percent of which have violated air pollution limits and it, it's even worse than that because of the disproportionality of where that pollution is but i'll let her talk to you about that Alexander Shekovich, welcome. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. I can't hear. Of course, of course. So billions in our tax dollars go to subsidize these companies or these tax breaks that they have. Can you speak to where the billions come from? That's right. So our report looked at 50 plastics plants across the U.S. that were recently built or expanded, and we found that two-thirds of them received upwards of $9 billion in taxpayer subsidies, yet 84% uh, of them violated their air pollution control permits within the past five years. And none of these plants were forced to give up any of their subsidies for breaking environmental laws. Um, we looked at a few state programs. Um, the majority of these plants are located along the Gulf Coast, but we also see some plants in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and elsewhere around the country. Um, and $9 billion, we were just shocked by that staggering figure. Yeah, Tony's got a little bit of a graphic you can see. That's the Gulf Coast, the bottom part. is a close-up of the, the wide part. Shows you uh, in the top uh, picture there, sort of graphically, where these plants are. So we're talking about uh, 591,000 people, according to your report, um, who live within three miles of these plants are people of color. So you're suggesting that the, the discharge, the illegal discharge of environmental toxins from these plants disproportionately affects these people of color, um, two thirds of whom live there near the plants. That's right. So um, within three miles of these plastics plants, um, our research found that, um, as you mentioned, 66% are people of color. That's well above the national average of 39%. A lot of these folks are also living next to multiple plastics plants. As you could see from the graphic you just showed, these facilities are clustered. And oftentimes these communities are living um, not just next to plastics plants, but other industrial sources of, of air pollution. And they're um, completely overburdened. Uh, what we found is that the, the just the 50 plants that we looked at in this report, they released uh, tens of thousands of tons of dangerous air pollution every year and uh, greenhouse gases as well, upwards of 63 million tons of climate warming pollution. And that's just what they reported releasing legally during the routine operations. On top of that, what we found is that 94% of these facilities also reported emissions during um, malfunctions, breakdowns, and other pollution events. Uh, these are things that, you know, occur when there's a fire or an explosion and, uh, you know, sometimes endangered not only the health and safety of the workers at these plants, but of nearby communities who are uh, forced to deal with, with the consequences. Well, the natural disasters that affect a lot of these communities are storied. I mean, this is uh, an area along the Gulf Coast, anyway, that is affected by hurricanes and walls of water come into this area that's called the Chemical Coast for a reason. They, they are flooded by these walls of water that essentially co-mingle with, there are more Superfund sites there than any other place in America. 
Uh, and Superfund sites are places that are so badly toxified that all this, the Environmental Protection Agency is dumping all this money into those areas to try to detoxify them. But anyway, they're more there than anywhere else. So this wall of water comes in, and it just floods everywhere. So all those chemicals, all that stuff, all those toxins go everywhere. And then now, based on your report, you realize that even when the floodwaters recede, you're dealing with a population that's inundated with toxicity. Yeah, this is well over a half million people. Um, and, you know, we're not just seeing events such as floods and hurricanes along the Gulf. We're also seeing inclement weather from, uh, you know, harsh winters and freezes. So a lot of these plants, what we also saw is um, an uptick in, in these incidents when there's a loss of power. And that could be the result of a hurricane. It could be a pipe freezing somewhere uh, along the pipeline delivering um, electricity or gas to these plants. So um, 94 percent of them, again, we just thought this was an incredible figure, over 1,200 incidents that we counted. And some of these, um, you know, it led to evacuations of nearby communities, school closures. We read reports where um, workers were um, seriously injured, you know, going home with third degree burns and other very serious injuries because these plants, they, as you mentioned, they ha handle hazardous chemicals. Some of them are uh, facilities that handle hazardous waste on site, in addition to making these plastics products. So um, it's just, uh, just very unfortunate. Well, I was just looking to uh, see the last time they had one of these uh, discharges of um, toxins, you know, in the Bay Area, where we have a lot of our listeners and viewers, we have this uh, Richmond, you know, Richmond's a, a place in the Bay Area where there are, is a lot of this uh, discharge from um, various uh, um, uh, petroleum facilities, uh, primarily, I think you can um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, or you can add some specifics if you want. But more to the point, uh, it's kind of what communities are sort of having to put up with. And these aren't even depressed communities, some of them. They're not even uh, communities that have been traditionally, I mean, sort of uh, uh, mistreated by a lot of corporate America. They're communities that everybody's doing well, and all of a sudden they're dealing with these, uh, with these discharges. So uh, your report, I guess is what I'm saying, uh, uh, is buttressed by a lot of this uh, what I would call just sort of a personal experience that we've had with this stuff. But the thing that's most galling is that there are more and more of these plants opening, and you note this in your report, and they're opening with state and municipal subsidies to help them get going. These are subsidized industries that are violating all these laws. Absolutely, and oftentimes these are multi-billion dollar companies that are wholly or partially funded by foreign governments. Uh, there's a plant that we highlight in the report that opened in Texas that is uh, you know, uh, partially funded and operated by uh, a Saudi Arabian SABIC, but uh, they're owned by the Saudi Arabian government. So one of the richest countries in the world was receiving taxpayer subsidies from uh, Texas schools, actually. Um, and I think that's a really important to mention is that this money that we are subsidizing this expansion with, uh, this is money that communities are not receiving to improve their, their school systems, to improve their roads, to pay their um, frontline workers, their fire departments, and basically to provide just basic public services that I think every American will agree. Uh, not only do we need, but we, we need to support those services now more than ever. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, that I think a lot of these plants opening are associated with jobs for the community, et cetera. And the reality is there's not um, there's not evidence that that is in any way offset uh, by the damage done by these communities based on your report. I mean, this is just astounding what's here. Um, you know, despite frequent claims by the industry that it would protect the environment, 84% of the plastic plants, 42 out of 50, violated their air pollution control permits over the last three years. That's according to the EPA's uh, compliance online database. And 63 million tons of greenhouse gases in 2021, that's as much as 15 coal-fired power plants. Again, reading from your report. Um, and it's not just uh, greenhouse gases, okay? It's, uh, it's benzene, which is a carcinogen. It's a very dangerous carcinogen. There's nitro uh, nitrogen oxide, which contributes to smog. Tons of carbon monoxide, which can cause headaches, dizziness, and can uh, collect in the, uh, the lungs and has been linked to emphysema. So you 
you realize that the, and I, I just stopped there. It goes on and on and on. And this is a really alarming report. Is it getting any traction in media? I mean, obviously, you'll being on this show will kick open your media presence. But I mean, apart from this. Uh, there, you know, there has been some traction, um, especially in the communities where these plants are located. Um, you know, we've seen some really high profile facilities open up in recent years, heavily subsidized by taxpayer money. And actually, that's what prompted this report is that we, you know, after speaking to community members and understanding you know, what's going on and just listening to folks that are living within a few miles of some of these plants, especially the Shell Monaco plant, which is a, an ethylene cracker that recently opened up in uh, in Pennsylvania in Beaver County. And it's, you know, it's really shocking what these folks are reporting. Not only are they seeing, you know, it's not just air pollution, there's also water pollution. They're seeing discharges into the Ohio River and they're also plagued by uh, light pollution as well as noise. You know, these plants operate 24 seven. You have to deal with the generators, you have to deal with excessive flaring, uh, which not only emits pollution, but it also um, lights up the night sky. So, you know, imagine not being able to sit on your on your porch and um, just in, in see the stars as a result of these plants, which are built and designed to operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it's just constant. And that's what these folks are dealing with. Well, and Alexandra, you talk in your report about the fact that most of this toxicity that uh, of which there is just tonnage and tonnage and tonnage, there is uh, no real special event associated with it. It's just routine use of the plant and through the routine hours and hours, day after day, as you suggest, this is the toxification of the environment around it that just follows a routine use of the plant, I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, I... I love that you're here. I love that you've made contact with our show because I'd love to have you back. I know that it, in your role as the research manager at this Environmental Integrity Project, uh, and you, you're the author of this report, it's called Feeding the Plastics Industrial Complex. We'll have a link to it uh, in below this video. But uh, you, you know, you really know a lot about the gas business and oil business and fossil fuels industry. And I'd love to have you back because uh, I'm told that we have a lot to do with the fossil fuels industry in this society. And uh, it would be great to speak to you more. So I hope you'll come back and visit. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Alexandra, thank you so much. Alexandra Shekovich from the Environmental Integrity Project. Right on. The Mark Thompson Show. Just unbelievable, Kim. You know, it's such a, it's a crime against the environment, you know. But uh, we're in the middle of uh, Mark's madness in our last couple of uh, moments here. I've got a lot of stuff now, to do. I can't I, it. Mark's madness. I watch with interest as uh, this is a little bit closer. Again, you'll vote for. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Either George Santos or the wonderful Ron. What the hell is going on in the United States of America? Yeah, again, you'll go for. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Or the wonderful Ron. What the hell is going on in the United States right, of America? Right now, Ron leads by 60, about 64% to 36%. So. And good luck. You can vote at the community section of our YouTube channel uh, through the evening hours until midnight tonight um the uh i'm just looking at i thought the the biggest surprise for me so far in mark's madness has been larry king seen beating out word from the lord i thought word from the mm. lord was going to carry that i really did this I, is a word from the lord and he's not happy no, yeah no, that's pretty uh, strong larry king seen crushed Word from the Lord. What can you tell us about the scene? So, uh, but it's great. We're just getting into it, and the commission returns tomorrow. In the first hour, we had, why are you yelling against Simon's hideous? It's why are you and, yelling for sure, right? Yeah, why are you yelling? It was, yeah. uh, I think it may be the biggest margin of victory that we've seen so far right. in Mark's yeah. Madness. If you're just joining us, the drops you hear are often used on the show. We come from the radio, KGO Radio in San Francisco. We brought the drops with us. We brought everybody with us. And we brought everything with us. And so mm -hmm. Mark's Madness is something we've done for years now, and we wanted to keep it going here. So that's where this is. But you don't need a bracket. 
You can just vote like everybody else. And as I say, you can vote in the chat till the end of the show, a few more minutes, and then you can also vote in the uh, community section. Kim, I'd love some news. I have that you for you. Hit me with some news, baby. Then I got mm-hmm. a... I'll leave you with an obit, but it's not sad. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. The creator... Um, we did something earlier in the first hour. The creator of um, the world of online movie reviews, he passed away. And it, the way he, you should go back and look at it. It's kind of a cool little, you know, it didn't, doesn't, I think it's going to be two minutes, three minutes that we did on him. But he created the, the world that is now Rotten Tomatoes and all that. This guy that I'll be featuring in a moment didn't create this thing. He helped get rid of this thing. And what he got rid of is sort of notable through the world of um, a law and order, I'll just say. Okay. Uh, With that, hopefully mysterious uh, tease, you'll hang out for a few minutes. Uh, Hit me with a thumbs up. Let's listen to some news. And then I will share that. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. I don't hear Kim, but uh, maybe Kim is... um, muted somehow well that's how that works uh this report is sponsored by sorry clicking and you're clicking at the same time this report is sponsored by tenuta vineyards in livermore so let's go straight to the supreme court where they are now allowing texas to enforce a new law giving local police the power to arrest anybody they believe is in the country illegally The high court yesterday allowing this law to proceed, immediately blocking it after the White House sued, saying it tramples on the federal government's exclusive authority to oversee immigration issues. Well, today, the court ruled this law can go into effect while litigation continues in the lower courts. So that is what is happening in the state of Texas. Apparently, they are able to enforce their immigration law and stop anybody that they think is in the country illegally. Okay, whatever you want to do there. Yeah, I mean, it's half a click off from total vigilanteism. I I mean, what could go wrong? Former President Trump says he'll need to sell some of his properties for cheap fire sale prices to pay for his $464 million bond in his New York civil fraud case. Not that he's selling the Trump Tower. I just have the picture up here as an example of things that he could offer at fire sale prices. Well, I mean, I'm glad you have it up there because it's, you know, it's in the game. All of his properties are in the game. He took aim at Judge Arthur Engeron, who ruled against him in the case. In a Truth Social post, Trump complained that the judge actually wants him to put up hundreds of millions of dollars for the right to appeal his ridiculous decision. Yes, that's how it works. So either you have the money or you don't. It's the way it is. Don't, I think, is the uh, don't choice. Don't have case. the money. Mm-mm. Yeah. Hey, I thought you had all this cash. I thought you had all this money. Where did it? Where does it go? Uh, it looks like the measles is a big problem. There is another outbreak, and now apparently a warning as well. We've got a big problem in this country with people not getting vaccinated and then ending up getting sick in ways that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. That's not fake. That's real. Mm. And so now we have an alert out for measles across the country. The CDC says so far this year, there are 58 cases in 17 states. That already equals the number of cases reported in all of 2023. Once eradicated, the CDC is once again urging families to make sure they get their measles vaccines. Doctors say, on average, one infected person infects 12 to 18 unvaccinated people. This is a big problem. The science (laughs) is ridiculous. The airborne virus can linger in the air long after someone leaves a room. That's why this is so communicable. The common symptoms, of course, include the rash, high fever, watery eyes, a cough, a runny nose, and the whole nine yards. No, but that is the common symptoms, but the effects of measles can be absolutely horrifying. Yeah. Um, What? Oh, yeah. Communicable. We'll bring it. Oh, I'll take the communicable. That's very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, like the little. Thank you so much. Oh, that's, that's right. That's right. Thank you so much. A new report shows huge amounts of being money donated to California Governor Gavin Newsom and other Democrats over the last six years from trial lawyers. The report from the American Tort Reform Association shows Governor Newsom getting more than a million dollars from 20 law firms. Those firms also spent almost a million dollars in the successful effort to defeat a Newsom recall in 2022. Attorney General Rob Bonta got more than a third of a million dollars. Former Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones, 227000 The Sacramento Bee reporting the California Democratic Party got more than uh, around $400 $25,000 in contributions from trial lawyers. California using new technology to better manage the huge amount of water resources stored underground. California stores more water underground than above, and it's been 10 years since the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed. A program called the Airborne Electromagnetic Surveys uses the state-of-the-art tech to track groundwater storage over the 16,000 miles of underground waterways we have. Managing underground water storage, tricky, because different materials require different methods of extraction. The electromagnetic survey scans one uh, to 1,000 feet below surface, giving water resource managers an accurate uh, measurement. I did not know we did that, so mm. that's kind of cool. I like it. Uh it looks like Sacramento schools may have a longer school year for the next two years as part of a learning recovery plan. In March, Sacramento Unified announced it agreed to this plan with the Teachers Association. They are going to add 16 more days of learning over two school years to make up for lost instruction days due to a strike. Uh, and, you know, maybe some of that learning loss because of the pandemic as well. So that could help. And maybe other school districts will follow suit. I don't know. Nonprofit arts and culture organizations generated $151.7 billion in nationwide economic activity in 2022, with nearly $242 million in the Sacramento area alone. This according to a study conducted by Americans for Arts. Organizations supported thousands of jobs, contributing significantly to personal income and tax revenue. The arts and culture industry supported more than 4,000 jobs and nearly $165 million in personal income, and that's just in the Sacramento area. So people are supporting the arts. And lastly, I will tell you, the FBI has returned a pair of ruby slippers stolen from a Minnesota museum to their original owner. The agency confirmed yesterday it returned the ruby slippers worn in the Wizard of Oz to owner Michael Shaw during a ceremony last month at the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids. The it's FBI fantastic. <laughs> calling yeah. the event a restoration of justice. Yes, I remember uh, when they were stolen we we covered the i think we covered the story here they say they had to keep the ceremony of the returning of the slippers a secret because of the ongoing investigation into the theft of the shoes oh. they didn't want anybody to know so it was a secret slipper returning oh, i love it morning mm. all right this report is sponsored by the wonderful people at Tenuta Vineyards. We love it. If you call them and say smash it with your iron rod, you get 10% off your wine order. 925-699-4576 is the number. You can also email rich at tenutavineyard.com. T-E-N-U-T-A, rich at tenutavineyard.com. Type the same thing, get your 10% off, and your why are you yelling red is on its way to your porch in a real hurry. I'm Kim McAllister, and this is The Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. It was great. I loved it. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. Morning. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? Stay at home and get baked. Right on, everybody. I uh, want to take a moment before I do this last story to acknowledge people who supported us today. We're a crowdfunded show, as you know. We exist really because of you. It's kind of like a PBS NPR mm -hmm. thing where they pitch you, and we have to do the same thing here. But there have been a lot of people who have stepped up, many on PayPal and many on Patreon. There are links to both Patreon and PayPal in our uh, videos and also below our live show. So you just click on those. It'll take you right to our page. 
Thank you, everybody who's uh, rocked that. And Tony adds you to the list of our patrons that we run at the end of every show because you are the reason that every show exists. And many step up in the moment and hit us on YouTube, and that's really cool, too. So if I have anybody to recognize from YouTube today, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to um, get to the beloved KGO legend Ron Owens, says Luis. We'll never fail to scumbag George Santos. Wow. <laughs> Beloved and scumbag in the same super chat. Or there is definitely something wrong with America today if that happens. Louise for the $5 super Big chat. Big shout thank out. You. I miss Ron Owen, says Northside Services Company. And yeah. again, thank you for the 10 Big spot. Shout out. I miss him too. And whenever I want services on the North Side, I choose Northside Service Company. <laughs> Big shout yeah. out. Cindy, how about a 10 spot? Always a great Yay. show and info with David K. Johnston. Couldn't agree more. Big shout he out. He is the greatest. So thank you for recognizing that. In fact, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Asley, again, one of the coolest names, Asley Petrus. Love the show. Love you, Asley. $49.50. So nice. $49.99. Oh. Big shout out. I mean, it's <sighs> Kim. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. Do you but need Asley, a hanky? Asley is yeah. really supporting us, and I appreciate it so very much. I really do. In fact, there's no appreciation like a British appreciation. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thanks to everybody who uh, smashed the like button, who shares shorts or videos or whatever. That helps expand yeah. the footprint, and it's free. You don't have to do anything but just share it, and you can uh, do that anytime and anywhere across your social media, that helps us. The Mark Thompson Show. So a guy died, and I thought in reading his obituary that it was particularly interesting. He lived to age 95, but was involved in the French justice system and worked to abolish the use of the guillotine. Oh, really? Yeah. He started as a defense lawyer defending his client from the guillotine. And this is back in the 70s. His client had been convicted, and he was trying to figure out the clothes that he should wear for the guillotine. He said, it's kind of crazy to even think about this because they cut the collar off of your neck so that that blade can go through i mean it's really when you think about it it's a it's medieval they it's were doing it though barbaric yeah until this guy i mean you can argue the whole process of killing somebody is right. its own barbarism but you know certainly this is definitely but when you think of it old world it's yeah. yeah it seems like you know ancient times it doesn't seem like 95 years ago when what when did they stop using the guillotine yeah so france still had it going right and in the <laughs> 70s and and uh, this guy, Robert Badint, Babinter, maybe that's the way he says it, or ba I'll just say it the American way that we would say it would be Badinter, um, <laughs> Robert Badinter. Um, he was representing as a lawyer these various people who were accused of pretty awful things. Mm. And finally, he was successful. Uh, and, and it's interesting because he really was brought up in a household there he is, that worshipped France and everything French and the French justice system. It says, right. Badinter had been brought up by his Jewish father to love France and its justice system. His father had fled to France from revolutionary Russia, arriving in 1919 with little more than his book-learned French, a fondness for La Marseillaise, and a conviction that France was the finest country in the world. That's why they went there. And for a time, for him, it was. Soon he had uh, a wife, enough money to buy his family a, a new apartment. And uh, his father had adored France with an intensity that no Frenchman could match, giving his sons French names, making them read 19th century novelists, they say, like Victor Hugo. But when Frenchmen started making these terrible anti-Semitic speeches, his father, whose conviction about France was unshakable, was still in defense of France. Mm. Even when his sons found graffiti, death to the Jews, scrawled on the walls, 
he had reassured them that this was a wonderful country, France, and you have nothing to worry about. Mm. Uh, then, of course, uh, life turned dark, and they would arrest his father in 1943, and he was sent to an extermination camp. Uh, mm. So there was every reason in the world for this guy, his son, Robert, who you see there, to not like France. But actually, he hated the people who were the Nazis. He hated the Vichy government. But he stepped up, and in a key case, he put the guillotine on trial, in effect, in defending the execution of a client, you know, essentially defending the client from that execution. He had redoubled his effort to get rid of the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And in 1977, he took this case in which a man had killed a young boy. And it looked like it was the man who was on trial, but Batin, Batinter or Batinet, uh, he put the death penalty itself on trial. And the jury were, the jury in the dock, they, in the, 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 they call it that, right? That's the... Um, the legal thing I'm, I'm reading from this piece sure. um, could he said this that you can sentence my client to death but if you did you should know that his death is on your hands you are alone he said and there will not be any presidential pardon and he won not only the vote to uh, get rid of the guillotine but they got rid of the death penalty completely in France as a result of his impassioned arguments and speech. Yeah. In 1981, the French parliament voted overwhelmingly to abolish the death penalty, and the guillotine was finally finished. And it's funny, when the vote was over, they say he walked over to Victor Hugo's seat in the Senate, placed his hand on the commemorative plaque, and thought, it is done. Mm. And he walked out into another Parisian morning. What How a guy. How must that have felt? Wow. I mean, talk about really doing good for a culture that you, oh, that you loved and that didn't love you back, you know. Or leaving a mar your mark on the world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, extraordinary. So anyway, that uh, is a passing that I thought uh, was just a curious one. And uh, I... I read it with interest and thought I'd share a little bit of it with you. So, The Mark Thompson Show. I also share this. Kim. Yes. Next with the uh, after party. We're doing it. Loving we'll do it live. I can all write it and we'll do it live. Yeah, Kim does it live right after this show. So check that out over on the after party live channel. We'll be back tomorrow with John Rothman and the developments of the electoral process, some of which I shared with David K. Johnston. We'll talk to Rothman about that. Also, in days to come, all my San Francisco Bay Area viewers and listeners, we have a candidate for mayor who is not London Breed who will join us on this show. So that is in the works maybe as soon as next week. A lot going on, everybody. Oh, yeah. Thanks for your support of the show, and... I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. Tony, you rock it. Thank you, pal. Always for Thanks, the hustle. Tony. And Kim, Kim, how are you? Bye, bye. Love you back. All right. Till tomorrow. Bye-bye.